Well, down there on Great Mills Road, St. Mary's Square, uh, there's this little Chinese takeout place that whenever we're going to order, that's where I call. We moved down here about six years ago, and uh, it's the first place we ordered from. And you know what? We liked it just fine. And uh, so ever since then, that's the place we will call, especially the shrimp lo mein. We just all really like their shrimp lo mein and fight over it after we're warm. But you know, uh, usually we get lots of food for around 26 bucks. That's pretty good to feed our family on that much. Uh, I, I loaded their, their number right into my, my contact list on my phone, and whenever I need a quick meal, I just hit the dial, and there we go. And I order it up, and then I go drive by on my way home, pick it up, takes about 15 minutes for me to get ready, come home, and voila, I have cooked supper, and everyone is happy. Uh, there may be other good Chinese food places around, but I don't even bother trying to find them, because once you find something that's good, something that's working, you tend to stick with it, don't you? Right? Every time I've ordered there, it's good. They, they always get it right. The price suits me. I trust them. I have no reason to try anything else. I have no reason to reject their Chinese food. Once we trust someone, we tend to stick with the dough. Today we're going to look at some very good reasons why we should stick with God. Why we should encourage others to do the same. We're going to be coming out of 1 Samuel chapter 10. Continuing on in our study in the book of 1 Samuel, it's been a good study, and we're continuing to grow and learn. We're going to look at a couple of verses here, as Samuel has uh, anointed Saul to be the king, and now he is calling the nation of Israel together to present him and to declare him to the people. Uh, this is where we are in the story, and we'll pick it up in verse 17. Therefore Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzvah. And he said to the sons of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of the kingdoms who were oppressing you. But you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from your calamities and your distresses. Yet you have said, No, but set a king over us, now therefore present yourself before the Lord by tribes, present yourself before the Lord by tribes and by your clans. I delivered you from the hands of all the kingdoms, God says, who were oppressing you. The Hebrew word here in this text, uh, hands, is Yad. That's very literal. The Jews had hands. And like us, and their word is Yah. But also the word for hand is used as an idiom, as figurative language. Yah can be translated to mean power. And after all, someone's power is often illustrated in their, in their hands, aren't they? Which is why ancient despots would cut off the hands of their enemies to symbolically and to literally illustrate to them, I have made you powerless. God saved, God delivered Israel, first of all, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And then he goes on and said, out of the hand of all the kingdoms who were oppressing you. Now the Hebrew word here for delivered is not saw, it means to snatch away, to escape, to pluck. When uh, my boys were much younger, I can't really do this anymore, but when they were little, we used to play this little game where, uh, actually it wasn't really a game, it was more like I taunted them, but I would hold something they would want in my hand, and I would say, you want it? Take it. And then they would try to take it, and I would just hold it, and then they would try to pry my fingers back, so I'd just turn like that, and turn like that, and they'd try to get a hold of it, and be moving around. And uh, that was quite fun uh, for me, anyways. We would sit there, and uh, I would sit on the couch, and they would sit there trying to get in my hand, and then they would get frustrated, they'd get more into it, more into it, and they would get to the point where they would get right up on me and sit on my arm, their whole body, and, and try to lean over my hand and pull it. So I'd just sit there, I'd let them work and work and work, and then I would overthrow them with my arm, and I would, I would pull it all away from them. And then sometimes, just to be even more aggravating, I would turn the hand against them, and I would start boring into their little soft, squishy bellies with my hand, and it would uh, tickle them and make them feel their pants, which is always a good time. But uh, it was a lot of fun, but the point was, 
I was always making is you're not fast enough and you're not strong enough to get anything out of dad's hand. So here is Israel trapped in the clutches of Egypt. But then God comes to them and he delivers, he snatches, he plucks them out of Egypt's hand and he takes them away. And even though the great Egyptian pharaoh took his whole army to stop them, he could not. Because the hand of Egypt was not strong enough. The power of Egypt was broken. Now, something jumped out at me as I was reading this passage. It, God said, I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms who were oppressing I wonder why he didn't say the hands of all the kingdoms. Since there was more than one kingdom oppressing them, wouldn't there be more than one power? Wouldn't there be more than one hand? Different kingdoms with different powers. But when you stop and think about the big picture, the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air, Satan, has authority over all the kingdoms of the world. He said as much to Jesus at the temptation. You remember in Luke chapter 4, verse 5 through 7, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, I will give to you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. What's interesting about that passage is that Jesus never refuted that claim. Remember? He never said, you're full of it, that's not true. That is true. At this time, the devil does have control, power, and authority over the kingdoms of the world. So when you put two and two together, you realize it doesn't matter which kingdom or kingdoms were rising up against the children of Israel. Their power all comes from the same source. The hand of the adversary, the arm of Satan, the power of the devil, it is what is strengthening these kingdoms against the children of Israel. So it is very accurate to say the hand of the kingdoms, because quite literally there's only one power. God delivered, he plucked his chosen people out of Satan's hand. Whether it was Egypt, or whether it was the Amorites, or the Moabites, or the Canaanites, or the Philistines, Satan could not, and never has, and never will, be able to overpower God's children. Now then, Jesus, in the New Testament, makes a statement about his and his father's hate. Remember this one? John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Don't you just love that passage? You say it this morning, didn't you? No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Isn't that great truth? It strengthens us to know that, doesn't it? It gives us confidence when Jesus knows us. And when we follow him, he gives us eternal life. He puts us in his hands and nothing and nobody can snatch us from his hands. He can snatch his people out of the hand of the enemy. He can break the power of sin. He can break the chains of bondage that the devil tries to hold us in. But his grasp can never be broken. The enemy can never pry you out of God's hands. Isn't that great to know? Absolutely. And that is so good. So that, you know, gives us confidence. And we think, yeah, you know, life is good. And Israel's good. And being a children of God is a piece of cake. And there's never going to be any worries. And there's never going to be any problems because we've got all this protection. Well, that may be so, but you know what often we do? You know what often people do? The same thing is really. We reject the God who delivers us. Verse 19. When, but you have today rejected your God who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. You've said, no, 
set a king over us. That has got to be the saddest statement in Scripture. It would make sense to reject the oppressive gods of Egypt who forced them into slavery. It would be wise to reject the gods of the Canaanites who required them to offer their children up as human sacrifices. It would be appropriate to reject the Philistine gods who endorsed it immorality in inappropriate sexual acts as part of worship. These gods who are wicked and evil and weak, by all means, reject them. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He is the God who delivers you from all your calamities and distresses. Why would you reject that? The Hebrew word for save here or delivered is yasha. Does that sound familiar? The root of that Hebrew word is in the name Yahshua, or we would say Joshua. Yahweh saves. Yahshua or Yasha means to open wide or free, to, to be safe, rescuing and avenging, <clears throat> preserving victory. All that is carried into that, that word. It's all tied into the name Yahshua. In the Greek, the name Joshua is Jesus. How do you pronounce that? Jesus. Jesus saves. His name testifies what he does. Jesus rescues us. Jesus preserves us. Jesus defends us. Jesus avenges us. Jesus gives us the victory. Jesus saves. He saves us from what? Verse 19. All of your calamities and all your distresses. The uh, Hebrew word here for calamity, that was translated calamity, is ra. It means bad, evil, wickedness. In 1 Samuel, it's used in chapter 2, verse 23, when Eli confronts his sons about their behavior, and he says, why do you do these things? Ra, why do you do this evil things? It's the same word used in Judges. Every time the author says the children of Eve, Israel did Ra, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, when I hear the English word calamity, that to me communicates problems or troubles that we are having. Struggles, right? My car broke down and I can't pay my bills and the roof's falling in. It's like a country music song, right? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> you know I mean? And these things that are happening to us. When verse 19 says God saves us from your calamities, it sounds like he's saving us from bad things happening to us. But when we use the English word evil... In my mind, that is a stronger, evil is stronger than calamities. The word evil seems to carry with it not just acts, but intent. Something about the character of the person. Something else, a small observation, but notice the pronoun. You always got to notice all the little things when you read, right? Because they're all communicating something. It says, all calamities, let's say Aha, uh -huh, there you go. All your calamities. That pronoun personalizes it, doesn't it? If the author said God saves you from evil, God saves you from calamity, that sounds like something bad's going to happen to you, but God pulled you out of harm's way. But it doesn't say God saves you from Ra. It says God saves you from your Ra. From your doesn't that in some way change it? You are no longer the innocent bystander about to become a victim of evil. When we say you're evil, you are not the victim. You are the... Ooh, there you go. You're the bad guy. You are the problem. When the Hebrew word says God saves us from your rock, which do you think it is? God saves us from bad things happening to us, or God saves us from our evil? Well, first and foremost, the number one thing that God saves us from is our evil. 
That interpretation of the text is consistent with the rest of Scripture. Is it not? Paul says in Colossians chapter 121, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies. Enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Like evil behavior. Come here, like amen, and yes, you do. My wife downstairs. Romans said, but God demonstrated his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You see what that is telling us? We have problems because we are the problem. We do evil. We sin. And because of that, we need a Savior. You need to be saved from your evil. Otherwise, you will suffer the wrath and judgment of God. But here the God who would judge us, the God who has been offended, is the same God who wants to save us. It's the same God who wants to save us. He has made a way to save us. He has paid for our sin. What is the price of sin? The wages of sin is death. Because of our sin, we deserve to die. But God decided, I'll die. I'll pay the debt myself. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God saves us from our evil. Are you trusting in him today? Are you trusting in Jesus today? Some are. Some, like Israel, are rejecting the God who saves us from our evil. And then people will wonder. You look at our, you look at our culture. You look at our society. People are rejecting God. And then they wonder, why, why do so many bad things happen in the world? Yeah, yeah, there can't be a God, a good God, because all is bad. There's so much evil in the world. Why is there evil in the world? Because people reject the God who saves us from our evil. There's evil in the world because there's people in the world. There's us in the world. And we need to be saved. The fact that there's bad in the world doesn't prove there is no God. It just keeps proving what Scripture dearly teaches. We reject God, and without God we're evil, and we're destined for destruction, and that we need a Savior. Also, God saves us from our evil, but He also saves us from our tribulations, our tatsarah. Are, is the Hebrew, the adversaries, the afflictions, the anguish, the distress, the troubles that we face. That is more the stuff that's happening or being done against you. God saves you from external problems as well. He saves us from ourselves and our evil, and he also saves us from the problems, the afflictions that we have. He does both. The psalmist says in Psalms 124, if the Lord had not been by my side, let Israel say, and he says it again for emphasis, and I think for preaching effect, doesn't he? If the Lord had not been by my side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been by my side, that, that'd preach. When people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive. They Anger flared up against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us been torn by the teeth, has escaped like a bird uh, from the fowler snare. The snare has been broken. We have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We know we have problems. And I know we have challenges and pain and sorrow, and life can be tough. That's why we pray every week. That's why we take time to say, give us the prayer requests and pray, and we'll try to get them back out to you, and we'll pray about these things all week because, you know what, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of need out there in the world. But think about it, brothers and sisters. As bad as it can be, how much worse would it be if it not for the Lord on your side? You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. And you got no, we got some extra money come in. Out of nowhere, you got some extra money, and then that very week, your car breaks down. Ever happen to somebody? 
And what do you say? Well, praise God, I'd have been in trouble if this money hadn't come in, right? Things are going bad. Your job's getting cut back. You're being let go. And then all of a sudden, you get a call for another company over here. And they're saying, well, we were thinking of you, about you. And you say, praise God, God had put somebody, uh, put me on somebody's mind. You're going through a tough patch in your marriage. There's stress. There's tension. There's that breakdown in communication. Now, I'm not just talking about one marriage in here right now. I'm talking about, I'm talking about everyone's marriage, aren't I? All marriages are like this, and we feel like that we're not going to make it, and we feel like there's no love, and we feel like there's no respect. Guess, but guess what? I can tell you from experience, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, you're going to look back at that, and you're going to say, if the Lord hadn't have been with us, if we wouldn't have stuck to the word, if we wouldn't have trusted in Jesus, we could have lost our whole family, but he saved us. He saved us. It doesn't mean that God prevents storms from coming into our life, it just means we know with God in our lives, with Jesus in the boat, that ship will not sink. The journey might be long, but if the Lord's by our side, we know we are going to make it. The battle might be fierce, and we might be beat down, and we might be down on one knee, and our, our, our strength might be gone, our youth might be gone, and the, and, the, and the death is coming for us. But even in that state, even we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we Fear no evil, because we know thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We know because God is with us, he saves us from all of our tribulations. There's nothing that can befall us. There's nothing that can destroy us, because Jesus gives us everlasting life. And all God's children say, amen. Question, why would you reject a God like that? Do people reject that God? They do. It says it right there in the text. And we look around, and we see all kinds of people who are rejecting him. We look at our culture, which once was way more, I mean, it's never been perfect, but it was a lot better than this. A lot more morality, a lot more prayer, a lot more spirituality than what we have now. And we can see that our nation is rejecting God. And the question is why. It's because they don't really know who he is. They don't really know what they have. People easily forget. People need reminders. People need to hear the testimonies. Samuel has been judging Israel now at this point, at this, uh, at this chapter 11. He's been judging them his whole life. Probably over 30 years he's been judging uh, Israel. The first time when he started, he took them to where? Some of you remember this from chapter 7, Mitzpah. And that's where he started, right? And now where are they in chapter 11? At the end of his ministry, where are they back again? They're back at Mitzpah once again, right? But 30 years ago, when they were at Mitzpah, they got all the nation there. And what was happening? Some of you, we've been doing this study for a while, I realize. And some of you are new, but the rest of you, you should remember. What was about to happen in Mitzpah? You remember? All of the Philistines had lined up and said, oh, they're all in one place. Let's come down and let's beat them and let's kill them and we'll be done with them. And all of the nation came up against them, and the nation was there, and they were scared. And they said to Samuel, cry to the Lord for us. And Samuel did the sacrifice, and he cried to the Lord. And what happened? God saved them, delivered them, plucked them out of the hand, and they were all safe. But you know what? That was 30 years ago. And what happens in 30 years? The people that were there aren't there anymore, right? People pass away, people move on, the younger people come on up. They don't know the Lord. They don't know who God is. And that's what's going on in our nation. That's what's going on in our society. People have forgotten. Older saints have passed on. Younger people don't know that the, the God, who they're rejecting. That means if we know, if we have experienced his goodness, if he's proven himself faithful to you, if we have faith, and hope, we need to share it, do we not? They need to hear these stories. They need to hear your testimonies. We need to tell people about God's mighty hand who pulls us out of bondage, who saves us from the destructive power of sin. Some of you are here today, you are all but dead, but God plucked you. Brother Jim, God plucked you out of that situation, and you need to tell, and we need to tell people. Also, you people who are living 
in luxury, who are living the victory, who God is providing and he's always blessing you, you need to share those stories. You need to say, God does this for me. Why is it so good for you? Why, is, why, why do you always have things working for you? Because God provides for me. He's taking care of me. And he always has. He strengthens me in my time of trouble. And when you're going through hard times, deliver that story. Deliver that message. Keep telling them, Susan. Keep telling your brother. Keep telling them. God will help you. Jesus is there. Put your faith in him. We need to be faithful even when everyone else is rejecting so that we can be a light, so that we can be a testimony, so that we can bring somebody to this God. Do not reject, dear folks, dear brothers and sisters. Do not reject so great a salvation. Father, thank you so much that we get to know you, that we get to draw close to you. Lord, may we not reject you. May we not abandon you. May we hold, path, hold fast to the truths and the promises that we find in your word, and may we boldly declare them in a dark and dying, needy world. May we boldly tell them of your love, of your salvation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's.